I love the fact that you chose to be with us in worship on this day, whether it's your thousandth time because you've been part of our church family for many years, or it's your first time, we're all together in this moment, lifting up the name of Jesus, hopefully higher than any other name in our life as we worship Him. So today, we're gonna to be wrapping up a sermon series. I can't wait to share this sermon with you. But before we do that, let's turn our hearts and our minds, our very beings to God in praise, who alone is worthy of our worship. stop in and say thank you so much for all that you are doing for our on-campus events like VBS and now our Zoom Sunday School. We want to thank you for the eternal impact that you are making in the kids and the families. And we can honestly tell you that we couldn't run this ministry without you. Mm -hmm. So thank you. We, we love, love you. you. <laughs> Bye. Hey, Bel Air family, Rebecca Bershay Morgan here. Just want to give a huge, massive shout out to our life group leaders and our rooted leaders. You all have been amazing in this season, stepping up and stepping into community, meeting online and growing together. And we are so grateful. Hey there, this is Cam Deba, head of communications here at Bel Air. I just wanted to send a heartfelt thanks to all those that have helped us throughout the years past and also those that are serving us today. If you've sent us photos of our services, if you've shared our emails, if you've helped our print team, everyone that has helped the Com Department, I just wanted to send a big, big thanks uh, because we couldn't have done it without you. So here's to the next year ahead. Thanks again. Hi, Bel Air. A very special thank you to our outreach and missional engagement volunteers. Whether you're serving from your sofa on one of our task forces or around the world on one of our mission teams, your commitment to loving others and sharing the gospel is so beautiful and very appreciated. Thank you. 
Hey Discipleship Volunteers, it's Pastor Mike here and I want to say thank you for your work during this season. And as I look at our Discipleship Center, I'm just reminded that discipleship doesn't happen in a building. It happens through a people, women and men like you. So thank you. Bel Air Worship Choir, choir librarians and instrumentalists who support your ministry. Thank you for the time, energy, love and prayer that you invest in leading us in worship week after week. We thank God for you, and we thank you. Hey, Bel Air Church family. This is Brian Ortiz, the head of worship arts here at Bel Air Church. And I just want to give a quick shout out to our amazing volunteers in the worship arts ministries. Thank you so much for your time, your energies, your talents. We literally couldn't do what we do, whether in person or online without you. A special shout out to our deacon ministry, Stephen Ministry, Celebrate Recovery, Financial Peace University, Crisis Care, Grief Share, and even our Foundations for a Healthy Relationships group. We are so thankful for your encouragement, your patience, your tenderness, your kindness, and even the initiative of lifting others up. We love you so much and thank you. Hey, prayer teams, Wednesday night Instagram prayer room, and our weekly prayer guide team, thank you so much for all the ways you care for Bel Air Church by praying and interceding for us. We love you and we're so grateful for you. Our Bel Air Kids Choir is blessed with wonderful volunteers and they are teaching the kids by example to serve the church. And then the kids in turn are learning to sing and praise God and helping lead the whole congregation in song. We thank our volunteers from the bottom of our hearts Hey, lay leaders, we wanted to say thank you for all the hard work and dedication you put into your ministries. Yes, you're a blessing to Bel Air Church. We appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Hi, Claire Crawford here. Just with a heart of gratitude to say thank you to you for partnering in ministry, for sharing your hands and your hearts in the things that we do in spiritual formation and soul care with women, with retreats, with big events of the church. You make ministry a joy, and I thank God for you. My heart is full of gratitude. Many, many thanks. God bless you. Hi friends, Alyssa Metropolis here. Just wanted to say a big thank you to our hospitality teams, special events, event decorating, and our EMTs. Your presence makes a more welcoming environment, so thank you for your hospitality and serving. Hey, Bel Air Student Ministries volunteers, we just wanted to say from the bottom of our heart, we so appreciate your dedication, your love, your prayers, your time, and your effort. We love you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. What's up, Parable Coffee Laboristas? Hey, I just wanted to give you a big thank you. I wanted to say thank you for choosing to volunteer with Parable Coffee Lab. This shop has been so affected by your volunteering, and uh, I'm so thankful that I've gotten to know you. I'm excited for the future. I just want to say God bless you. I hope you're well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much to our online hosts that are in the live chat every week. You've been so faithful and wonderful and been such a human touch for people during this time. And you are amazing. Thank you so much. Hey guys, JT, thinking about you. Just want to say to all the volunteers at Bel Air, past and current, far and wide, there's so many of you. Um, we see you. We love you. We appreciate you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Well, on this last Sunday before Thanksgiving, we are wrapping up a four-week sermon series on a very short section of scripture where the Apostle Paul writes a letter to a first century group of Christians in a town called Thessalonica. And we find ourselves in the middle of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, where the Apostle Paul gives three commands. We've uncovered these to be joyful always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks to God in all circumstances. And as we've gone through each of these three commands, if you've been with us, we've taken a look at how uh, there is one environment where joy and prayer and gratitude can really thrive and it's in the presence of God. We've also taken a look at the expanse of 
of joy and prayer and gratitude and how it can be limitlessly expansive in the same way that God is without limits. His presence is everywhere. And as we experience life in the presence of God, that there are no limits to the joy, our ability to commune and have conversations with God and even the gratitude that can flow out of our lives. And then finally, that when we look at the end of, of joy and prayer and gratitude, as defined by scripture, on one hand, there is no end, but also it's for a purpose and it's for God's glory and our transformation. Now, it would be really tempting for me to put a period right there after the three commands. The problem is, is that there's not a period right there in scripture. In fact, the apostle Paul ends the thought. He concludes this section. And so I'm telling you, it would be so tempting for me to just wrap up the series, maybe just do a sermon on Thanksgiving uh, or do something else. But what we are getting to right now is a topic that has been debated over, that has been wrestled with, that has been chewed on by the greatest theologians, by Christians around the globe for thousands and thousands of years. Because today, we're going to get to God's will. What a complicated, mysterious maze of a topic. You know, I don't know if you ever experienced these when you were a kid, but growing up, I don't know if it was like a product from the 80s. It was this uh, square plastic blue maze with a marble inside. The problem was, is that that maze was two-sided. And so literally you would have to kind of roll the marble through this plastic maze and then there would be holes in that maze that would then drop it down a layer that you would then have to flip that maze up on its other end to now reveal another maze. And right in the middle, I don't know if you had one like this, but there was this uh, little hourglass, except it wasn't an hour. It was like five minutes worth of sand that was on this um, kind of rotating thing that when you flipped it over, it stayed dripping, <laughs> flowing the sand down, constantly stressing me out, trying to figure out this mystery of a maze to get that marble from the beginning to the end. Now, in a lot of ways, I feel like the topic of God's will is like that times infinity. And I really believe, honestly, that to get from the beginning of a study of the will of God, ultimately to the conclusion to understand all of its fullness is never going to be done in this lifetime. In fact, I, I likely believe that even when we're in God's presence, that there's going to be aspects to God's will that we fully won't comprehend. And yet we're going to know all the fullness of all that we're ever going to need to know in God's presence one day in the new heavens, the new earth. And so that finds me in you in this tough moment right now where I'm going to attempt, and I've been praying about this and studying to finish up the sermon series with the conclusion of 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, as we see that all of these commands are God's will for us in Christ Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, this is 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. And you know, I'm actually gonna begin in verse 16. And what I end with will be what we'll preach on today. 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This, my friends, is the reading of God's word. And as we say every week, thanks be to God. Okay, so uh, the mystery of God's will uh, in 35 minutes. My prayer is that this sermon would actually invite you deeper into um, a longing for, a pursuit of, a study about, and uh, an appreciation for, and an obedience to God's will. It seems like uh, more and more God's will is becoming uh, less and less appreciated. 
uh, maybe overly simplified and frequently, sadly, co-opted by our will. And I'll cut right to the chase. You know, God's will, God's intent, God's plan, God's counsel, uh, God's purposes are the best thing for you and for me, in fact, for all of creation. In fact, living out God's will is the best way to live. The problem is, is that we often, we exert our will over our life and we exert our will, our plans, our counsel, uh, our intent over and above God's will for our life. And there are problems that ensue as a result. In fact, uh, you might have a plan for your life. You might have a, a, a goal. Maybe you've set a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. Maybe you have uh, ways in which you think that you can accomplish certain things. These aren't bad in and themselves, but if you do so disconnected from God's plan and God's will and God's overarching desire for your life, you're going to miss out on the depth of what the Apostle Paul talks about here is a life of joy, of constantly being in prayerful communication with God and of deep, deep gratitude. Also, we have people in our lives that have a plan for our lives. Maybe it's a, a family member. Maybe it's a, a friend. Maybe it's an employer. And they have a plan for your life. The problem is that they, nor you, created you. And ultimately, there is only one who is qualified to give you a plan for your life. There's only one who is qualified to extend their will over your life in a way that is perfect and good and beautiful. And it's the only one who created you, God. And so as we get into God's will for your life, we're gonna talk about the environment of God's will. We're gonna talk about the expanse of God's will and we will talk about the end of God's will. So as we talk about the environment, if you've been with us the last number of weeks, we of course have talked about the environment of joy and of prayer and of gratitude is existing only in the depth of them in God's presence. And I'll say it this way, the, the environment for God's will is in the presence of God. Now immediately, maybe your mind is trying to wrap its mind around that truth, Scripture reveals that God is omnipresent. That God exists not only eternally and outside of time, but God exists everywhere. God's existence or God's presence is at the cosmic scale all the way down to the microscopic scale. In fact, there is no place, no environment in the world, in the cosmos, in your very being, in your places of work, even in places where it seems like God is absent, there is no place that God actually isn't present. And this requires a lot of faith. This requires a lot of uh, submitting to what God reveals about God's presence to even wrap our minds, uh, even just in a little bit of way around this, that that God's will is everywhere. In fact, some scripture passages that talk about this, for example, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, the prophet Isaiah writes this, speaking on behalf of God, as one who is speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit. God says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my purpose, God says, shall stand and I will fulfill my intention. Even calling a bird of prey from the east, a person for my purpose from a far country. I have spoken, says the Lord. I will bring it to pass. I have planned and I will do it. I want you for a moment to grasp just an iota of the power of the will of God. God has the ability to simply speak, let there be light and there is light. Isaiah 
is the instrument through which God reveals that there is no one in the planet who can do that level of execution of their will. I mean, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, who uh, are willful people, who are powerful people, who it seems like they speak and things happen. They have an ability to, through the resources, through their connections, through the position that they have in life, to be able to seemingly speak things into existence. You know, they, they, they make things happen. Maybe you know some people like this, whether personally or from afar. Maybe you, in maybe a small way, have this ability that your will be done as you intend. And yet you know that there are always limits to human will. That actually, in some cases, we've seen throughout the course of human history, we've seen it in this year, we've seen it in our lifetimes, that there are people who their will, their intent comes to an end. And there might be seasons where their will is expressed and gets things done wherever they are present. And yet we also see that there are certain cases where a person can be present and formally powerful, their will can no longer be done for whatever reason. God alone is unlike any human being that has ever existed because God's will is always accomplished. And in fact, it says here in Isaiah that God's intentions are never thwarted. God alone has the ability to make plans and never have a, a pandemic get in the way, never have uh, circumstances get in the way. God can make plans and there is no a canceled flight that can stop God's plans. In fact, when you read all of scripture, rather than just cherry pick a couple verses here and there to figure this out, but when you read all of scripture, there is this consistent, overwhelming truth that God alone is unlike anyone else, that God has a perfect and a pleasing will that is sovereign over all of creation. And that the environment of God's will is everywhere. Another verse. In Job 42, 1 through 2, after this long experience and conversation that goes back and forth between Job and his friends, and then ultimately Job and God, God reveals God's self and, and who God is in such a powerful way that then Job is humbled and then responds near the end of the book of Job and says this, then Job answers the Lord and says, I know that you can do all things that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now let's come back just for a moment to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Paul is saying that God has a will for you in Christ and it's to be joyful always, it's to pray without ceasing, it's to give thanks to God in all circumstances. Part of God's sovereign will isn't just to speak things into existence. Part of God's will isn't just to uh, have all of creation exist. Part of God's will is that you as a human being would experience a relationship with your creator. And as a result, that there would be joy, that there would be communion with God, that there would be gratitude that would flow up and through your life. And this is where we must get into the expanse of God's will. And this is where, this is where there's great difficulty in trying to articulate using a finite mind, something so infinite. This is where in some ways it's, it's absolutely impossible to, to enter into the mysterious maze of God's will to somehow comprehend in a way that, that at the same time doesn't leave still a little bit of frustration because we can't see the full picture. Leaders and theologians, Christians for thousands of years have tried to articulate in human language God's will. And a lot of different theologians have even put God's will into different categories to describe the, the nuances, the layers, the, the facets of God's will. So for the purpose of this sermon today, I'm just going to talk about uh, two categories of, of God's will, God's sovereign will and God's secret will. God's Sovereign will, will, some people refer to it as God's 
perfect or divine will is all expansive, is all consuming. Some verses that, that speak to it are this. Uh, Matthew 10, verses 29 through 30. Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So if you can try to just for a moment grasp this. Jesus, the Son of God, is saying that not only is every death of a bird something that fits within God's will, but even God's will is so expansive in God creating you and me in the image of God that God actually knows the number of hairs in your head. For some, that's easy. It's zero these days. For other of you, how can you even begin to count how many hairs you have on your head? Well, God can. In fact, you know, like that, that maze that I used to play with as a kid, the only way I would get through ultimately to the end would frankly be I would, I would hit some dead ends and realize, okay, that is a dead end and that won't get me further in and so I have to back up and go a different way. I found that in the study of God's will, as I come to God in prayer and through scripture, that there is a dead end that I reach that is uh, a, a, an answer that many mature followers of Jesus have given. And it's this, there are many mature followers of Jesus uh, who I, I respect and I consider this a, a great mystery that we can debate these things. But I found that a dead end is this, that when some people say, well, there are certain things in life that are God's will and there are certain things in life that really aren't God's will, not part of God's plan, not part of God's intent. Now I can see on one hand how this helps someone when they go through experiences in life where there's tremendous tragedy, when there's heartache, when there's sorrow. I think about in my own life, the tragic death of my younger brother. I, I think about the miscarriages that my wife and I experienced. I think about things that have happened in this world that I've seen. On one hand, I would truly, I would be put at ease and I would be filled with a sense of peace if I could just say, none of those things were part of God's plan. None of those things were part of God's will. However, I've experienced that that is only a temporary road of peace that ultimately leads to a dead end as I study scripture. Let me explain. To say that there are certain things that happen in life that are part of God's will and certain things that happen in life that aren't part of God's will I've experienced actually creates a problem. And it creates a problem where we as human beings have to then be discerners of what is God's will and what isn't God's will. That puts us in a position of knowledge where we can begin to determine and exert our preference and our will over the definition of what is and what isn't God's will. And so I've seen this played out in really heartbreaking ways, even within communities of faith. Most recently, I think about how some people have said, well, uh, you know, the 2016 election in the United States was God's will, but the 2020 election wasn't God's will. And then people within our own church have also said, and I've heard this over the last couple months, no, actually, in fact, 2016 election was not part of God's will, but the 2020 election was God's will. And immediately there is this clash. Immediately there is this train wreck of an understanding of the will of God. And I believe that arises from trying to figure out what is God's will and what isn't God's will. And this can get played out in our lives it can get played out in relationships. It gets played out in the question of, well, why would God allow there to be suffering? And sometimes the answer is given, well, suffering isn't part of God's will. God just, you know, allows it to happen. And for a moment, that gives a little bit of peace, but I've experienced that ultimately, like that maze, it hits a dead end, especially when I get to scripture that says, 
Nothing can happen apart from God's will. One verse that speaks to that, for example, is Proverbs 16, 33. It says this, the lot is cast into the lap, but the decision is the Lord's alone. Now, a lot was an ancient kind of form of dice, if you could say it that way. To translate this in a modern terms, that every time a dice is rolled, the play is for God. That somehow every dice that is cast playing Yahtzee or craps or whatever it might be, that every single dice roll somehow fits within the will of God is to speak to the expansiveness of God's will that somehow is a great mystery. And rather, I found, rather than trying to discern, well, this is God's will and that's not God's will, I have submitted myself to the fact that all things somehow exist within the will of God. And yet clearly there are certain things that happen that God speaks out against, that grieves God's heart, that God clearly says is sin, that God clearly has consequences for. And so rather than lop all of that off and say, well, that's not part of God's will, somehow I have to trust and I have to believe that God's sovereignty that somehow God's majesty still is able to work out God's will even in the midst of all of these circumstances that have arisen in life while God is still in control, while people still have free will. And that's the great complexity of this dance between the sovereignty of God and the free will of humanity. That ultimately it is God's sovereignty that overshadows and has authority over the free will of God, not the other way around. You see, if it was the free will of humanity that was more powerful than God's sovereignty, then God would be out of control. Then God wouldn't be God. Then God wouldn't alone be worthy of our worship. And so the sovereignty of God, which is all expansive, somehow, as God invites us deeper and deeper in, to trust, to believe, to have faith that somehow God, well, as Paul says in Romans 8, that God works things, all things, not just some things, all things together for good for those whom God has called according to his purposes. Now, the danger is when we go the other way, and I'll say it like this. If there's danger, I believe, in trying to lop off events in life and saying, well, only these things are God's will, but these things aren't God's will. There's another danger. It's a little different. It's, it's just as dangerous, I believe. And it's when we say, well, well, all of things, all things that happen are God's will. And the danger is when we say, why? So, for example, maybe you've heard in the last number of years, certain even... Christian pastors, Christian leaders who will say, for example, Hurricane Katrina was God's will, was God's punishment for the people that were sinning. And maybe you've heard that and maybe you react the same way I react and I go, no, what on earth, what kind of Bible are you reading to think that God uses storms to punish people? And intellectually, it doesn't compute because you look at these hurricanes and there are believers and non-believers, all different types of people who are in the path of these hurricanes. And so the danger is, is when we ascribe a why to God's will. And we say, oh, 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 the reason why that happened is because of X, Y, Z. And in those moments, in the same way, we, we are exerting our will, our preference, our, our knowledge on top of God's will. And so I found that, that even though on one hand uh, that can make things in our lives make sense, we can connect the dots even in ways that uh, don't line up with scripture, our mind likes that synchronicity. Ultimately, like those mazes, we hit a dead end. And I found that it is much more helpful to say, 
God, somehow this is part of your plan. Somehow this is part of your will. I don't get it. But help me to have joy in you. Why? Because you're good and your love endures forever. Help me in the midst of this to, to press in and to pray, to talk with you about you, about me, about others, about the world without ceasing. God, help me to have a gratitude, not for these circumstances, but in these circumstances. And God, I don't get it. And I don't like it. And yet I'm going to trust and believe that, God, you are good. That your love endures forever. And somehow we can begin to enter deeper and deeper and deeper into the mysterious maze. The beautiful maze. The perfect maze. The loving maze of God's will. You see, it's remarkable how God uses even the worst things in life to accomplish God's will. And I have seen this in my own life and I see how, and it, you know, it's always looking back that things begin to click. It's, um, this is not to give a nice, neat, pat answer, but I look back and, you know, I think about the, the tragic death of my, my brother. I think about the infertility my wife and I experienced. Somehow that, I believe, was part of God's will. I believe that much of that broke God's heart. That it's not part of a thing that, you know, God is just joyful about to see God's people suffer. And yet God's love and goodness is greater than that. And God has used it in such a powerful way that I feel like I have a completely different perspective as a pastor entering into the grief of a family when they've lost a loved one. Somehow that shaped me and molded me in such a way that I am uh, more human, I believe more compassionate as a result of it. And I think it's overly simplistic to say that God did that so that this would happen. And yet there is a deeper truth, a deeper richness that I've entered into where I realize that, that God has always longed for me to be compassionate. God has always longed for me to enter into people's sorrow. And even though these things have happened, that hasn't thwarted God's plan and purpose and will for me to be that type of a person. And I believe that even if my brother hadn't died, that God's will was for me to be a compassionate person. He reveals that in scripture. And whether it happened or didn't happen, didn't deter God's will from being accomplished. I think about the infertility that my wife and I have experienced. God has somehow used that in such a way for us to have a different perspective on the kids that we have now. Both Judah and Barrett, it's a deeper gratitude. And there's, there's moments where they're driving me crazy and I have to be reminded, okay, God, what a gift. What a gift. I remember what it was like where I didn't think I was going to have any kids. I remember when the doctor said, give up, you'll never have kids of your own. But I also think about how God has used us in conversations with the many other couples that have had their own struggles. That somehow that's been a door that people have been able to step into when they know what we've gone through. You know, Scripture calls us to bear one another's burdens. And I don't think it'd be, you know, it'd be overly simplistic to say that God engineered that so that this would happen. No, I believe that, that God longs for us to bear one another's burdens. And even though we had that experience, that that experience didn't thwart, it didn't deter God's plan and purpose for our lives. I found actually a tremendous freedom when I submit to a sovereignty of God that is way beyond comprehension, a sovereignty of God that in some places seems a little irrational. I found a tremendous freedom and a peace that happens when I just, I submit to say, okay, God, somehow, and I don't get it, somehow this fits within your plan. It helps when I put myself in the disciples' shoes, imagining what was it like when they looked at the life of Jesus being drained away as he died on the cross. I mean, I think about that moment and I can't even wrap my mind around what that would have been like for three years, some of them following Jesus he was to be the savior of the world. He was to be the Messiah that would, that would bring God's kingdom on earth. And somehow now he was dying. 
Now, of course, we have the long view of history and they, they saw it many days later. But in that moment, would they not have felt that the will of God somehow had been thwarted? And yet God's plan was not deterred. His purposes were not deterred. And in fact, Luke says in Acts chapter 4 that actually all of that, even the arrest, the death of Christ was part of God's will. Now, some theologians have really struggled with that. Maybe you've heard the phrase that, you know, gosh, that to say that it was God's will for his son to die is, is, is like divine child abuse. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. And this, you know, this is where these sermons are so difficult because you begin to run into some of these problems. How could it be God's will for his son to die? And this is where if I take a human perspective, it can seem like, yeah, how does that make it? I don't like this. What kind of father would do that to his son? And yet I have to come back to God's word. I have to be reminded. Psalm 136. God is good. It is outside of God's nature to do anything bad. It is outside of God's nature to do any abuse. It is outside of God's nature to do anything wrong. It is outside of God's nature to do anything that is evil. God alone is good, far beyond a good that we could ever comprehend. And God's love endures forever. So somehow, even though it doesn't make sense, even though the maze does not make sense, I cannot allow myself to run into the wall and say, well, that wasn't part of God's plan. I guess that just happened. And somehow God, I don't know, had a plan B. No, there's this sovereignty. There's this great mystery, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 11. Who can know the unsearchable links of the mind of God? There is something actually freeing that happens when you realize this is a maze. And I don't have it figured out. Actually, in the, the mystery of that, I found personally in deep ways there is a joy there is a pressing in and of prayer and there is a deep gratitude that flows out of my life because of that mystery. You see, the sovereignty of God is something that we can explore the depths and the riches of the rest of our life and only scratch a little bit of the surface. But there's another aspect to God's will. It's not just his sovereign will, it's his secret will. You know, in uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, Moses, in a great speech to the nation of Israel before he dies, at the end of 40 years in the wilderness, he says this. He says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever to observe all the words of this law. Moses says that there are actually plans that God has that only God knows. There are secrets hidden in God. And yet he also says there's an aspect of God's word that has been revealed, an aspect of God's will that has been revealed, and it's God's law, God's word. In fact, everything that we need to live a life of love, of joy, of significance, of peace, of generosity, of justice, of mercy, of forgiveness, of grace. Everything that we need to know has actually been revealed to us through God's word. This is the revealed word of God. And yes, there are secrets hidden, God. For whatever reason, God hasn't revealed to us. I don't know. I wonder, will God reveal all that to us in God's presence in the new heavens and the new earth? I don't know those things, but what I do know is that I have all of God's revealed will in the pages of Scripture. And somehow all of it, even the parts that don't make sense, somehow fit within the framework that God is good, that God is loving, that God's love endures forever, and that the expanse of God's will flows into my life and is an invitation for me to submit my life to the will of God. That will to to know God and be known by God through a saving relationship in Jesus Christ. 
that it, God's deepest desire is that we would experience what it means to be in relationship with our Creator. And that we can respond to that, that the call that every single one of us has on our lives to follow Jesus, that that is the first step to experiencing, to entering into the mysterious will of God. That when you say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your lips and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, in a sense, you, you, you enter into the experience of God's will. And in God's will, which is also God's presence, there is joy, there is connection with God, there is gratitude, unlike anything else. And that as we follow Jesus, as we put into practice the way of Jesus, that this isn't just some person or some great teacher's plans for your life. It's not just some person's will for your life. It is God in the flesh saying, this is how I long for you to live even in the midst of the great mystery, even in the midst of all the things that don't make sense, even in the midst of the things that happen that we say, God, how can that happen? And how can you still be good if that somehow fits within your will? There is still a massive amount of God's revealed will that he invites us to put into practice. And that's that great invitation of faith to be part of a community where we get to work out the experience of our salvation together. We've talked about the environment of God's will only being in the presence of God, which is all expansive. That There's no place, no thing, no opportunity where God's will cannot be perfected. But there's also an end to God's will. On one hand, end as limit. There is no end to God's will. It is perfect. It will come out into the cosmos and return, not void, but in the ways that God intends. But also there is a a purpose to God's purpose. There is uh, an aspect of God's will that on one hand is utterly mysterious and yet is beautifully revealed throughout Scripture. I love how Jesus, you know, before he dies, I shared this a couple of weeks ago, he speaks with the disciples and he prays a prayer. And I believe that this gives us kind of like a, a little sneak peek into the will of God, a little, a little cracked window into the glorious light that is God's will for our life. This is in John 17. This is a prayer. I prayed this a uh, number of weeks ago. And for whatever reason, I feel like I need to just read this again. John 17. It's the longest prayer of Jesus recorded in Scripture. There's no other prayer that is longer in Scripture that Jesus prays. And he prays this for you, not just his disciples back then. He prays this for you. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your, no, your name, God, known to those whom you have given me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the entire world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they're yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I have glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and now I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you may have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost 
so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. So sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. And skipping down to verse 25, Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know you, that those who have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. There's a purpose to God's will, and it's that you would be one in Christ, as Christ is one in God the Father and God the Spirit. There is a purpose to God's will, and it's that you would experience the love in Christ that Jesus, the Son of God, experiences in relationship with God the Father and God the Spirit. Somehow there is this great expanse of God's will. It's as good, it's as pleasing, it's as perfect, it's as beautiful will, and he longs for you to be caught up in God's will, caught up in God's plans, caught up in, in God's purposes so that you would experience a wholeness, a oneness, a joy, a peace, a love unlike anything else. So would you, with me, with our church, enter into that mysterious maze of God's will? Would we pray as Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's be a praying church, a praying people that long for, that pray for, that strive for, that bring God's will here on earth, starting with me, starting with you, starting with us. God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, these are lofty things to, to spend a bit of time considering and yet these things are intended to be an invitation deeper and deeper into a relationship with you. So I pray that through the power of your spirit, that you would lead us deeper into your truth, deeper into a relationship with you, that we would know and live out your will, God, here on earth as it is in heaven. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray and we say together, amen. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb chosen me your love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer 
am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God You split the sea so I could walk right through it my fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea so I could walk right through it My fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child of God I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Again, I'm so thrilled that you were with us today. I also want to remind you that you were made for community and topics like this are best discussed in dialogue in community. And if you're not part of a community of faith here within Bel Air Church, we'd love to invite you to go to our website to get connected. And while you're on our website, you can check out resources that we have. You can explore our social media. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. But don't miss this opportunity to press into the mysterious, beautiful reality of God's will, to get caught up in it for God's purposes here in this life. We want to equip you on that journey as we together follow Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. May God bless you as you go in peace.